Ready? Hello and welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, a video game music podcast. This is episode 23-3 and we're your hosts. My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm caffeinated. Yeah, we, are, we, are, we both are this time around. <laughs> <laughs> Every week we listen to great video game music from all consoles and all generations. If it's good, we're going to play it. And this week is a special episode. We have um, a live, this is a live stream, live recorded stream how do you say it for now how do i we're, we're recording before a live youtube audience yeah i couldn't think of a, of a good way to say that but yeah so hold on my microphone's really quiet so we're recording in front of a live youtube streamed audience i'm really really excited about that it's always fun honestly like i think it's funny how we originally started doing this as a sort of all one-off thing and then it became mm-hmm. hey this yeah. is a good thing to interact with our patrons and now it's just something i look forward to every month oh like, yeah it's become a great thing so it's it's weird, like chatting with folks and just being live and mm. having a goofball of a time. Oh, so I love it. I, I love it too. We have um, so if you are a member of our Patreon um, uh, page, patreon.com slash rhythm and pixels, you get access to one of these live recorded episodes once a month, and you get access to prequel episodes, which are about ten to fifteen minutes, uh, three times a month. So every other week that we don't do one of these shows. Um, so that's really awesome. And I guess before we get everything started, we should probably say, uh, hey, everybody, I hope you're hope you're safe. I hope you're well. Um, and if you're looking for ways to cope with the pandemic or the social unrest in your neighborhood or in your community, we encourage you to go out there and, and help clean, help help your fellow people in any way that you can. Yes. Um, uh, uh, buy buy food and donate food and water to people who are in need. If you're not sure where to go, um, look for the local uh, shelters, the YMCA's, and churches if you're inclined, and mosques. Every every all these places go go. I encourage you to go do that. Um, people yes. need it now more than ever. Mm-hmm. In the heels of you know um, idiot gun nut protesters. I'm going to say it. I don't care. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, um, uh, possibly spreading the pandemic. Now we have um, people who are rightly angry protesting and also could be spreading it even further. So please be careful, everybody, and um, help help the people around you. And just the more good you're doing, the more good everyone else is going to do. In short, yeah. be a positive asset to your community. Oh, or I- do what you can to be a positive asset to your community. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, your, your, the people near you, the people around you, um, yeah, continue to be positive. And you can do so much, you don't even know it. Also, drink ginger beer because it's delicious and it's non-alcoholic. Oh, is that, it's yeah, just right, is that what good. you're drinking right now? Oh, I'm drinking three things. I got <laughs> non-alcoholic craft ginger beer okay. from Reed's brand. I have a general, a normal, basic Coca-Cola. And I have caramel coffee. No sugar, all cream. But caramel. Yes, that's right, caramel. Huh. But no sugar. So is it like a, 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 like a sweet and low? You know, one of those little fake pod flavors they provide. Like, I don't, they don't, I don't know what they put in there because they claim it's no sugar, but they got to get something there to make it taste <laughs> like caramel. So I just kind of assume it's like, you know, Splenda, like, yeah. it's caramel shavings or something. I don't know. Some, <laughs> caramel some shavings. weirdness that they throw in the cup to make it taste good. <laughs> Well, um, last week, our topic was uh, music for studying. So you're studying music. And as we've been doing, we like to take the topics that we like the most or the most popular and kind of open it up to our Patreon uh, listeners and our our listeners in general and ask what your um, favorite music within the topic would be. And then we'll play that. And we also will read uh, testimonials as written in the email or the Facebook DM or on the Discord, all those places where or we have, Skywritten, yeah, Skywritten, anywhere where you can get a hold of us, um, in the mail, you know, uh, a pigeon with a little note attached to it, and so before I eat the pigeon, I'll read the note. <laughs> Don't eat the pigeon. That pigeon did nothing to you, but it will do something to your stomach. Leave that pigeon alone. Pigeons are full of disease and good meat, but they're so. Adorable, and they do that cuckoo thing that pigeons do. You leave that pigeon alone. 
I've been really into the birds in um, in my uh, neighborhood. I've been sitting in the backyard a lot. I've been watching. We have uh, a family of robins. We Ooh. have a family of uh, blue jays that are terrorizing all the robins. <laughs> it's a, a car- bird war. Yeah, uh, uh, blue jays are aggressive. Um, we have uh, cardinals. We have um, doves, like morning doves, that are really fun to watch. There's an owl that I can only hear, but I love hearing it. And there's a bunch of woodpeckers that are always waking me up in the morning. It's really nice. It's really, really nice. Just there's, there's fewer there's fewer airplanes in the air. So I'm just hearing all of these birds every day, and it's really great. I'm just kind of laughing because it makes me wonder if you just revealed to me why Toronto chose the Blue Jay as its mascot for oh, baseball. I yeah, I bet. It's what a aggressive bird. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll attack the other birds and eat their eggs for sure. Jeez. Yeah, I, I guess it's what... See, I was about to ask what the name of baseball player from the Blue Jays, but I was like, wait a minute, this player was referenced, but I know this name because of bases loaded, and I'm sure this guy has long since give up baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? Um, I don't even remember his first name. It was like Olrud. Olerud was oh. his name in the game. O l r e, um, um, Olerud. O l e r u d, basically. And he was the best. He was like my favorite hitter in the game. Like whenever he came, I was like home run time. I would like do the whole finger kiss. And, like it's going out there. Like, you point at the screen, like up to the top right corner. It's going to that part exactly. of the TV. I'm sitting it over there. It's gone, baby. <laughs> and of course, that would just make my brother like beat him. So it's it's, it's hard to tell. But uh, yeah, I loved bases loaded. I I loved the Toronto Blue Jays back then, and I don't know any other team players. The, the next like live oh, streaming we do, we should we should play sports games like that, like classic like like Tecmo Bowl and like bases loaded because those those were fun. Those were a lot of fun. But I have no mom to tell when you cheat. <laughs> I'm not cheating. I just know the game. <laughs> you know what to cheat. Don't hate the player. I'll I mean, hate the cheat. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't hate the game either. <laughs> but hate the cheat. Hate the cheat codes. <laughs> All right. So um, we have uh, picked. So we, we received a whole bunch of suggestions of you know, musical suggestions for this week's show. So um, we can only pick so many, which we picked quite a few. And with that said, of course, don't let that statement deter you from submitting tracks nonetheless. Yeah, um, we keep all of your uh, requests and we save them as backups for future episodes. Definitely Mm -hmm. do. Um, And um, yeah, and it's good having a a great, great selection of tracks. I like to definitely pick music from um, listeners that we haven't had on the air before. So we Mm -hmm. we do those. So, um, all right. So why, why don't you kick us off for now? All right, first off, I'm going to punt this ball. Um, I'm going to punt it. Um, well, first track is going to come from a game that is seriously on my to playlist, and I've been slacking, but someday I'll get there. Um, comes from listener Chris Murray, and this is from Fire Emblem Three Houses titled Learning Lesson. Are listening to a fantastic track from the game Fire Emblem Three Houses titled Learning Lessons, submitted by listener Chris Murray and composed by one of or more of these three guys because I cannot narrow it down Takeru Kanazaki, Hiroki Morishita, and Ray Kondo. Uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses, well, is a game that's on my daunting list in that I want to start it, haven't gotten around to it because I know that once I do, it's going to require like 100 hours of my life. <laughs> and, oh my god, I'm having difficulty with it. I'm still playing Trails of I, Cold I, Steel Chapter 1 because of this. I know, I'm afraid of games like that, man. I just... They're usually worth it. That's the roughest part. Like, they take so long because they fit a lot of narrative in such a, in such a package. And you want to get experience as much of it as you possibly can 
which means you're going to be playing it for a long time. Um, but let's read Chris's testimonial. It says, This track plays when you are instructing your students and they are studying for certification. So it is literal study music. Yeah. But it could also <laughs> be a decent track by which to study. Given that I've put about 170... There it is. Boom. I've put about 175 hours into this game and your God. protagonist is an instructor. I've heard this track a lot. So it's a good thing. It's a good one. As Chris mentioned in the chat as well, you hear it about 10,000 times in the game. Chris, you're a play tester for Nintendo, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Secrets revealed. <laughs> Oh, that. funny enough, Mixix Master mentioned his first ones on the GBA. Funny enough, in America, yes. But actually, they were coming out on the NES back in the day. Like Fire Emblem's been around for a good long while. We just didn't experience it until the Game Boy Advance when Nintendo finally was like, you know, people really like this Advance Wars game we put out that Intelligent Systems did. Maybe you'll like this one too. I get fire. They should realize by smiting uh, force. Breath huh? of fire all the time. I get it mixed up with breath of fire all the time. The funny thing is, I think there are some characters that can turn into dragons in Fire Emblem, but it's based on a race of characters, not so much like a power up or anything. Hmm. The like there's certain Fire Emblems where you can have like yeah, they're like, or they're not even really half. It's almost like they're whole because they just say I'm going to become a dragon now, so you just become a dragon. They like, I'm okay, going to become a dragon now. Boom. Oh. <laughs> Just don't decimate my house. No I problem. like having my video games in it. <laughs> All right. I've been spending this whole time trying to fix my mouse. And I think it worked. And great. also eat nuts. I've been doing that too. Um, my mouse was filthy. It is clean now. <laughs> Just a little scrub a dub dub. All Takes right. care of business. I, I like this track. It's very, I can see it playing a whole lot in the game. And it not really taking its toll because it's really has a lot. It's very string. It's stringy. It's a stringy song. Stringy. <laughs> stringy. Not <laughs> strings. Well, oh, delicious though. I mean, it tastes good. All right, I'm gonna pick my first track. This is gonna come from uh, a new Patreon member, Sonic Medley. And this is from the game Life is Strange. This is the main menu music composed by Jonathan Morali.
listening to the main menu music from the game Life is Strange. This came out on the PlayStation 3, I think, and the PlayStation 4. And this is composed by more... Oh my gosh, what's his name? Jonathan Morale. I can't remember his first name. Um, so yeah, what Life is Strange is a really um, thought-provoking game. That was like um, a documentary. <laughs> this is a what? This is like a documentary. Life is truly strange. Like, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely in the title. Um, you play uh, a teenage girl in a small town in Oregon, and she discovers, I think, yeah, she discovers that she can time travel. She can see events that are going to affect future events and change those things from happening. Um, it has some really heavy topics of just, you know, starting college and making friends and losing friends and drugs and suicide. There's a lot going on. It's, it's pretty intense. It's good. I've only played the first episode. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I will say there's something to be said, and this might be you and listeners in the chat that can comment on this, but as difficult as it may be, I actually am seeking games that talk, that tackle those sorts of heavy topics that do it well by that. So, like, for example, I love Persona 5, something fierce. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a point in the game where that specific topic was factored into the plot. But I didn't like particularly how they did it because it was mainly just kind of used as a narrative force to drive one other character to do stuff. And then it just kind of got dropped. Yeah, Um, I I hit one, like, like, really heavy and really um, emotionally, almost, like, manipulative, like, like, like things are used to just drive plot points, you know. That, that's no good. Yeah, I want it to be done tastefully, well, and in a way where I can come away going, "I this made me think." Mm-hmm. And the the author did a great job of putting it into good context. Because yeah, games are meant to be entertaining, but entertainment can be informative and thought provoking too. Yeah, um, this is a good. This is a really good study track. I mean, just that kind of like strumming. It's really lazy strumming, like, you know, just uh, uh, of the guitar, but there's still a little melody that kind of carries it through. It's really good. If you look for, if you look up this music on YouTube, there's like a 10 hour like loop of this, of just this. It's, it's pretty, wow. good. yeah, I'm sure people have listened to it all the way through. I'll tell uh, you, man, like mm-hmm. getting the harder, the deeper I got into VGM mm-hmm. and I will say, I won't even lie. I'm not going to front. Doing, starting the podcast with you was a heavy part of what got me pretty much like all, all in on like the VGM as opposed to just like I love my VGM now it's like I live it, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I it, live it, it Pennell. <laughs> it's sound it's a soundtrack for so much of Have a good night, Chris Murray. Good night, Chris. I keep saying night as if it's evening, but you know what I mean. Yeah, but um, it's still, it's still light out. Ma- I still have work to do in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's such a major part of my life now. And there, yeah. It pretty much soundtracks almost so much of what I do. Mm. Even if it's not playing, it's playing in my head. Yeah, me too. It really, really me too, which is incredible. Um, I've been playing, I've been searching and trying to play a lot more uh, VGM and DDR also. So um, and I have uh, the theme as Act 1 from ActRaiser. It's okay. a good one. I have uh, the, the first stage from Batman for the NES played that recently and now right now i'm trying to play a uh, katamari on the rocks <laughs> dude that song is like 10 minutes long it does not stop i get halfway through it i'm like done <laughs> which is a good halfway further than i can get so there uh, you go <laughs> it's crazy 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 but yeah i've been so i've been it's just like i don't know like especially like classic stuff has really been going back through my head uh, uh recently and i've been really enjoying that 
Um, what else have I been playing? I, I went back to Bloodstained. Did I tell you this? You did. You said, because we were talking about because you said you weren't doing La Mulan anymore. Yeah, yeah. And you went back to Bloodstained, and we agreed. Well, you stated it, but I, I was like, I understand that when you were like, Bloodstained is like a very comfortable game. When you start it up, mm-hmm. low stakes, beat jokers up, and get cool gear. <laughs> yeah, I finally got some like really game-breaking um, power-ups, and I'm about 75 or 80% to, uh, of, of search through the entire castle. Mm-hmm. And I feel like right now is where I'm really making progress. But th- seriously, I played about five hours, like maybe the other night or, or the night before, and the game crashed twice. Yeah, they that game, as long as it took for them to bake that cake, yeah. it should have stayed in the oven longer. <laughs> yeah, not only did it crash, like fully crash twice and like had to like re- reboot the, the PlayStation 4, um, one of the one of the bosses got caught inside of a wall. And so they were doing all of like their moves and attacks, but they couldn't actually advance on me. So I just kept hitting the wall until they died. And then I'm like, what's going to happen? Is the game going to crash if I kill the boss inside the wall? But thank God it didn't. I, w- I would have been so mad. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were about to say the power up that he leaves spawns inside the wall. You can't collect it. <laughs> no, no. It was the dumb power up. Maybe it's used somewhere else. I haven't figured it out yet. Some, some of the, the areas in that game, like you really have to farm items to get the power up you need to get there. Which I was Whoa, surprised so about. actually required power ups need yeah. to be farmed? I'll tell you right now, the um, getting in the water for the first time opens up a whole new area for you and then you get better power-ups to travel through water better but to do it the first time you have to kill like this jellyfish thing like over and over again until it gives you the right power-up well, like, I, just, I, I had to look that up because I, was, I knew that was where I needed to go next yeah because um, usually in that style of game the required power-ups are guaranteed from specific kills or uh, you find them in specific locations but the grind yeah. for it kind of hurts the flow i think yeah yeah i was a little uh, disappointed by that but the rest has been okay i will say though and then my last thing about bloodstain before before we move on was i ended up uh fighting the last boss way too early i just ran into it um and then killed the last boss and got like a bad ending and then got the game over screen but i didn't realize it was the last boss because it's been so long since i played i forgot what the story was (laughs) <laughs> actually i think that castle of ink that symphony of the night originally allowed you to do something similar like yeah. if you weren't for me you could just walk right up to the final room and beat the tar out of i guess it was richter mm-hmm. and like whoop there's a game <laughs> Turn it, off. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was all over and i was like okay i have to look this up and it's like oh that was the final boss and it said well, you need to find this item and do this and I, I stopped reading i was like wait 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 i can figure that out on my own i just had to know that that wasn't the end of the game <laughs> i'm actually when, when i beat uh, like- momodora Mama, Momo, 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 Adora, Reverie. You, you nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> it was um, Momodora. When I finished that game, I wasn't sure if it was really the ending or not, but I actually got the good ending on that. Like, I had no idea. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it was just, it was such an anticlimactic short ending to that game that, that I really enjoyed. And I'm with it, Cameron it, on this, though, honestly. Cameron Wormer says, stories are relevant, blood stays, stay with most Castlevania games. Like, know. And I agree, like, you can get into it, but for me, I'm like, it's there, just tell me who to beat up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm good. I, I, I've been skipping the dialogue, honestly. The dialogue's not great to begin with, it's fine. I it just is like weird. I like the game artwork on its own, I like the combat, I like all the items and weapons, but I'm not doing any of the crafting, any of that. Okay, I gotta stop talking about Bloodstain. But I will say this one last thing, though, because you made me think about it, What's and that? this has been weird for me, so, like, I've been doing a lot, you know, I, I do game reviews and stuff, Yeah, yeah. Um, usually audio ones now, like, I'm... Because I, I, honestly, just between the volume of games I get and the fact that I can I can speak a review much faster than typing one up, um, I've just been getting to a point now where like I might get a game. For example, I just reviewed Shantae and the Seven Sirens, mm-hmm. and like I was going to the dialogue, and I very flat out was like, I don't care about the plot. <laughs> <laughs> I playing this game, and I'm going to tell you as the person <laughs> reviewed it, the plot does not concern me. I don't care. It's some yeah, hokey nonsense nope. that's meant to get you running underground. That's all it is. That's funny. And I just kind of like joke about it. Like in the end, it's like, now don't get me wrong. If a plot is really engrossing and it grips me, I'll note it as a plus. Like this is a platform that makes you care about the characters. But otherwise it's like, look, genies are locked in cages and dungeons. They haven't been fed in weeks and they're not dying. So I, it's just this weird stuff. Like none of this makes sense. Shantae gets healed from golden chickens. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> It's just how I've become like, with this It's fine. Man. This world is okay. I'll live here for a while. <laughs> exactly. Give me some golden chicken and golden crabs. It's sold, baby. All right. What's your What's your next pick? 
All right, my next track comes from Listener Butzbo. Hmm. Um, this comes from the game, which I've actually never played, though I'm familiar with it. Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. And it is the library menu theme from said game. Oh, another place where you would study. That's right. Let's give it a listen. Well, in the Yu-Gi-Oh! world, you're not studying your dueling <laughs> or you're preparing dueling very, to duel. You're quietly dueling. <laughs> is that what it is? Uh-huh. That's so good, man. That's really cool. I love what they did. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Welcome back. You've listened to the library menu theme from the game Yu-Gi-Oh! Wow. That was Forbidden awesome. memories. Thank you. That was so good. I, that was so, so good. <laughs> I couldn't find the specific composer of the track, but as far as the game is concerned, we got Naoki Ishii, Waichiro Ozaki, and Hiroshi Tanabe. As music composers from Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memory. No, man, that is Shoji Maguro. You know that's Shoji Maguro <laughs> <It laughs> from, from Shin Megami so Tensei. Like it. Yeah, yeah, it sounds a lot like a, a P1 or P2 track for sure. Mm-hmm. And I was fond of what I heard. Um, wow. The, the butt spell went, went above and beyond on this one. It's no secret that I, I like the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise. You too, for that man, at least for the TV show. Like, I love the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise. I suck at Yu-Gi-Oh! deck construction. Which is why I never get very far in any of the play sessions. Like, for me to get far, it involves me. How far can Perno get on the default deck with maybe two packs added to it? Um, that's me in Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. Um, but I've never played Forbidden Memories. I just remember seeing the cover at the store when I worked at KB, because this was back when PS1 was still thriving. And we had a ridiculous amount of PS1 titles. And this was one that we had in abundance because it was during the Yu-Gi-Oh! boom period. Um, oh, I, I never... remember the Yu-Gi-Oh! boom of 1996. That's right. It was pickaxing in the backyard. Boom! Struck and the, cards! And then the Yu-Gi-Oh! bubble burst. And then we had the Yu-Gi-Oh! bubble crash of 1997. <laughs> the Yu-Gi-Oh! crash. Of, I gotta tell you, we went hungry some, some nights now. I and mean, sometimes you just found yourself eating, you know, clockwork night cards just to get by. <laughs> It was tough. It was real tough. Yeah, that was in trap mode. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, these stars talk like, God, see, now when, I, when this episode is done, I am probably going to boot up Yugi because I did buy the Nintendo Switch version that came out. And it's waiting for me to get involved. But again, I don't know when to start games anymore. <laughs> so it's like, when do I get in? But after this episode, for nostalgia's sake, I'm going to start playing Yu Gi Oh! Legacy of the Duelist. Um,. But enough about me. Let's talk about Buttsbo and what he had to say about this jam. Majestic jam. All right. This track goes all the way back to Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories for the PlayStation. The game is an unusual port of the card game in that it simplifies a few of the mechanics, taking away the monster effect and focusing a lot more on making monster fusions. If you played it, you may remember how essential it was to learn the fusion of the two-headed Thunder Dragon to get far enough in the game. In other words... Pernell would not have done well here. <laughs> <laughs> While listening to the game's OST to revisit the catchy dual themes, I came across this track I have completely forgotten about, which plays when you browse your stock of cards. Oh, okay. While the name Library easily connects with the study theme, there is something about these deep and maybe a bit dark echoing synths, which I find really immersive to concentrate to, and I always look forward to the scaling segments starting at 26 second scales, which is a nice payoff for this short loop. That's nice. That's really nice. It really is. I love how dark it is. It's like it's dark and funky. It's it's 
So cool. So Wait, cool. Wh- I'm going to just say, but Spo, if you like that track, man, kid you not, hit up the Persona 2 OST specifically. Yeah. Both Innocent Sin and Eternal Punishment. I guarantee there's going to be a couple tracks in there that hit a similar note for you. Oh, God. I, I mean, I need to play Yu-Gi-Oh. See, I always do try to tell myself I'm going to make like a theme style of deck, and it just never gets around. I never quite hammer the whole thing out. Like At one point, I was like, I'm going to make a deck that has nothing but elves and magicians in it. <laughs> that didn't take <laughs> off too well, though. Um, but also worth noting, give um, if you've never played Cult Set before, give that a try, because it also hits some notes relevant to this style of gameplay, but it doubles as a Monopoly-esque board game. Yeah, I keep forgetting Cult Set has played like a board game. Mm-hmm. I guess it's it mixed good. up with that one where you're like you're 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 running like a dungeon and you're supposed to you're supposed to torture people. Dungeon keeper. It's a dungeon. Keeper? Oh oh no 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 dumb. You're talking about. Uh, you know it. You know the one. I do know it. I'm looking at the di- the cases right behind me too, but I know the I know nightmare the- print deception deception deception. That's what it's called. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, like and like the fourth one is called um, well, just like I don't remember what the subtitle is anymore, but the follow up game was the Nightmare Princess, which is the uh, one I need to dabble more in. Okay, okay, okay. God, that ah. game is so good though. It's, it's crazy when you get really into Deception, it gets redunk. Like you get you get the spring loaded platform that launches the knight into the air, which then slams him into a chandelier that has spikes on it, and they fall straight back down onto a fire pit. Yeah, it's like a weird puzzle game, but you're like you, the puzzle is to make people. Um, feel pain. I don't know. It's so strange. It's creative trap links. Yeah. Yeah, traps. It's all traps. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's nice. such a weird cost. Can you imagine being like a, a monster or something, but your only power is the ability to create traps. Like, you can't actually fight anything. Your whole gimmick is you can put traps on the floor. <laughs> you can have a booby-trapped house, but that you can't me. defend yourself. There's a show. There's a show. Um, it was out a year or two ago called Miracle Workers, and it had Daniel Radcliffe and, and um, Steve Buscemi and a bunch of other really great actors. And it's a comedy, and they play um, uh, Steve Buscemi is God, except he's really like, kind of like he's he's not. He's kind of like a, 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 a like a stoner kind of God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he doesn't want to do anything. But the angels are just, or it's just work. Heaven is just a big office building. When people die, they go to work in the office to, to keep the universe going. But Daniel So Radcliffe, social work. <laughs> yeah, it's a social work, yeah. And Daniel Radcliffe um, answers uh, prayers. Um, so he actually does miracles, but he's the only one in that department because they, have, they can't afford anybody else. So he can only answer one miracle like a day or a year. And it's always, and he can't directly do it. So if someone prays to like find their keys or something, he can't like show them where the keys are. He all he can do is like set traps. He can only like he can make the wind blow, and it, and it carries the scent of flowers. And it's supposed to remind somebody that flowers is where I kept my keys, you know. And and, and so it's kind of like he kind of sets these little uh, these little like trap. Um, uh, sequences to get people to fall in love and stuff like that. It's really silly. It's really, really good. Convert that to deception style play. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the air smell like blueberries, which is gonna get them nostalgic. They'll start walking blindly into my spring-loaded spike trap. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Because we need more workers in the office. And then when they're on the ground, I'll whip them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my track comes from uh, listener Hammock. Hammock. Hammock from KVGM, The Last Wave. This is from the game, uh, a newer title called Coffee Talk. That's on Steam and Switch, PS4 and Xbox, composed by Andrew Jeremy. And this track is called Silent Rain.
You're listening to Coffee Talk, Silent Rains, composed by Andrew Jeremy. And this was selected by Hammock. Hammock! <laughs> um, and Hammock says, when I was in college, I needed some lo-fi, trip-hop, or acid jazz, chill-out, down-tempo beats to soak up my knowledge. I do a lot of background research for my current job, and when I'm not in the booth at the KVGM studio, and the soundtrack to Coffee Talk on the Nintendo Switch is perfect. Credit goes to my wife for finding these jams as she downloaded the demo and played it. Although there isn't a whole lot of playing to be done, it's mostly listening to customer problems, pouring different brews, and making foam art. Fun! And then in parentheses, not fun. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was starting to means, wonder if we should, I would recommend like maybe try Valhalla, because... Mm. I was reading about Coffee Talk 2 and came close to trying to grab it, but the issue ended up becoming that, like he said, there's very little to no gameplay in Coffee Talk. It's mostly the talking element. But Valhalla actually has dialogue, a bit of, like, um, gameplay in the form of, like, trying to, like, convince people to reveal specific information. And there's actually a narrative behind it, too. Like, it's it's a little bit more to it. You play, like, a robotic um, bartender, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't recall if she was a robot or not, but you definitely do play as a bartender in a futuristic society. That's cool. I like that idea. Um, that's by the like that was like a sequel, or it was by the same people who did uh, that other that other story, visual novel-y type one. Um, I'm talking about tw- read only memories. Read only memories. Yeah, same people. Yeah, I only know that because they both cameo in um, Yuck or Y2K. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's interesting how they both, how 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 those games kind of made their appearances in another game. Yeah, you end up going into the mind of a specific, a specific character, and in her mind space, Turing is at the bar that's being tended by the main character of Valhalla, and they both can talk to you. So it's not like they're just like there and they can't be interacted with. They actually chat with you. Oh, that's <laughs> it's cool. kind of cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I really like this. It's it's very much that kind of lo-fi hip hop. Um, sound that's been really popular the past few years, um, but it's I don't know it's a little cleaner than that lo-fi sound. The the beat is a lot more, a lot more straightforward. A lot of times, those lo-fi beats, the 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 um, uh, the rhythms are very shuffly, maybe a little lazy, kind of like ahead of itself or gets a little before itself. I really like that, but this is nice. This is like really really cool and collected. Is music you can forge fuse cards to. <laughs> You could. Also, we we gotta take a note of this, by the way. Bedroth suggested doing a beat 'em ups then and now episode, oh, which I think idea. is a great idea. Yeah, I'm, okay, you know what? I'm putting on the list because now we have a list, and I'm gonna put it on it. <laughs> also, I don't know if it makes sense as we do this a lot anyway, but I think it might be cool. We should do another RMP recommends episode because I started thinking I have like 500 games on the Switch now, <laughs> so it's like I want to recommend games to people, <laughs> like. It feels like a good time to do it. <laughs> and of course, recommendations through music is the best way. Oh man, we got some good ones coming up. Like some good episodes coming up. We have um, uh, rental. Don't spoil rent- it. Don't spoil it. Well, uh, we have one coming up um, that I haven't told you about, so we need to do that. I'm not sure. I don't Ooh. think we talked about it. <laughs> so, don't spoil it for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna surprise you. No, I should probably tell you because we have we have a different recording time for that one. And that might tell you. That's a clue, Pernell. That's a clue. Ooh. A galoob? Anyway, I do love this 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 type of music. What I end up doing when I'm like doing training or doing matches in Street Fighter Five is that I'll turn the music off and then put on like a live YouTube station that plays nothing but this kind of music. So it doesn't fit the vibe of a of a street fight, <laughs> but it but it keeps me going. Well, the training of a street fight isn't really like the intense part of me when a guy's at the gym punching a mannequin for like three hours i don't think he's really feeling the intensity of that at a certain point it's just more like all right rope just try to get this move down it's when you're fighting the other guy and it's actually death the like balls to the wall if i win i get all the glory that's when you get the intense music duke, 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 balls duke. to the wall that's right <laughs> Wasn't there an episode where that was like a running game? Yeah, that was it was the VG it was the VGM jukebox. It was the last episode of the VGM jukebox that we were on. Oh right. And we got obsessed with trying to figure out what balls to the wall actually meant. <laughs> because uh, I think it was Alex, Alex Messenger suggested a track from Doom 
brother, and it was super hardcore. And we all were like, this is balls to the wall. And then that's right. And Emily was like, what the heck are you talking about? (laughs) What does that even mean? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. That's actually one of my favorite memories. That's so funny. I agree. So funny. All right, Pranel, what's your next track? All right. So going down the hole of rabbits. Yeah. The next track comes from actually, I guess I ended up choosing two of his tracks, but this came up earlier in the episode. But that's me. Um, also comes from Chris Murray. This track is titled Paul Esteem from Earthbound on the SNES. And it's composed by Hirokazu Tanaka. I just realized something. There is a track on here that I picked that didn't show up. That's why I was lost when you were like, what like, where the other track was. Shoot. It's too late. We'll play it. We'll play it later. All right. Well, I'll pick it as my fourth track and I'll switch <laughs> it up. All right. Because I, I can't not pick this track on the episode. Ah. So um, you were listening to Paula's theme from the game Earthbound, composed by Hip Hirokazu Hip Tanaka. I'm a jam fan fiend of this Mamma Jamma. Uh, I love the Earthbound OST in all of its splendor. I love Earthbound, period, in all of its splendor. I'm staring at my Earthbound box right now, actually. It's a decoration for my room. Uh, but yes, this track is a good one. Um, and honestly, I can see it as a good study track in the sense like, you have to get kind of fall into the melody, though, because if you don't, that din and then will take you out. But then it's, you come back into oh, the. I, I, it's, that, it's that first part though. The first part's got this weird off-key thing going on. It's unsettling, man. It's it's, <laughs> it's making me feel kind of like seasick listening to it. <laughs> You're in a boat now. Yeah, yeah. It's like. <laughs> oh God, you think that's bad? There's some tracks in this game that were. Will truly make you feel like you're like I know. unsettled and on a, like about to get seasick. This whole soundtrack, it's so interesting. It's the, it's cool. It's hip. It's hip, <laughs> but like they did some really interesting stuff with the sound design of it. But it's it's just all over the place. It's so strange. So let's see what Mister Murray had to say about this sweet beat. All right, this is Paula's theme from Earthbed. She lives in the school, so there you go. She lives in a, in a school. That was a- I love this game oh. so much. Now there's more. <laughs> I love this game so much. When I wasn't playing so many new games, it was on my once-a-year list along with a few other SNES games that I rotated between. The game really picks up speed once you expand the party, especially because of how rough the inventory control is in the game. One of these days, I'll have to prioritize Mother 3, but for now, enjoy this chill track. Hope y'all are staying safe. Thanks for keeping us stocked with great podcasts every week. And it's funny that he makes that comment because there was a point, I can't remember why I brought it up, but a couple weeks ago I made a Facebook post which ended up devolving into us all talking about how much we hated the Territorial Oak enemy in the game because of how he would blow up and kill you if you don't end the battle quickly enough. God, that was such a brutal way to start a game. And the level was called Peaceful Rest Valley, which was just wrong. The titling was wrong because there was nothing peaceful about that place, and no one felt rested by the time they were done. It was mistitled, it, it, is what it was. Yeah. It's totally mistitled. It was just cruelty, 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 cruelty. Territorial oak. Um, but yes, it's. I love this game. You should say that your Earthbound box is not just an, a box for the game Earthbound. It's like one of those 
giant boxes they used to like have the display on the stores, right? Oh no! Nah. Well, with Earthbound, it was special. It uh, it only got released with the strategy guide. It was their way of trying to sell the game because they, I, I believe, in, I'm pretty positive about this. Nintendo wasn't really expecting a lot of people to gravitate towards it because the gameplay style was very Dragon Warrior classic esque. Like you know, can't see your characters, just a bunch of names at the bottom of the screen, blah blah blah. And most importantly, the game was freaking weird. Um. But it was a giant box because it housed the strategy guide in it, too. And, of course, unless you were like a hardcore collector back then, which a lot of us as our younger selves were not, most people threw that box away once they got the game because it took up a lot of space in your bedroom. Yeah. So, the first time I had the game as a child, I was one such person who threw away because my dad was like, get that out of here, you're just cluttering your bedroom up with it. But as an adult, when I reacquired the game, Oh, you made you bet your butt I was looking for the box and strategy guide, and I got the whole shebang and never got rid of it again. So, yeah, I know you've had it for a long time too. So, whoa, Wicked Sephiroth with the trivia, which I never knew. Oh, what's that? What 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 does Wicked Sephiroth have to say? He said that the level was originally called Grateful Dead Valley, but oh. they censored it, and that makes sense too because there was a lot of random censored stuff in Earthbound. Mm. Grateful Dead Valley makes so much more sense. For, oh God. Because of musical copyright lawsuit fears of Japan, because America sues everyone. <laughs> That's true. In fact, I'm I'm involved in several lawsuits right now. <laughs> Stop it for the podcast. No, really, no. Crap. No. I'm just shielding you from all this uh, pain, Pernell. <laughs> <laughs> it's a happy Pernell's happy go lucky for a reason because he doesn't know he doesn't the horrors. Know. He doesn't know the truth. All right. Um, so I'm moving on to my last track proper. This is from uh, suggested from Davy Cakes. This is from Final Fantasy VIII for the Sony PlayStation, composed by Nobuo Uematsu. And this is Balam Garden, or Balam. I call it Balam. Balam, Balam Garden. Balam. Balam Garden. Balam Garden. Blam. If you're here, your family. Balam Garden. <laughs> Never ending breadsticks. <laughs> at the Balam Garden. Gun swords at the Balam Garden. Mm. Come here to the Balam Garden. For now. It's delicious. For now. I don't want to go to the park. For <laughs> <laughs> The theme of Balam Garden from the game Final Fantasy VIII for the Sony PlayStation, and it is composed by Nobuo Uematsu. Man, this Uematsu. game brings back memories. Like the song brings back memories of the game that I, from when I played with um, uh, Ass Man as the main character. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking Seinfeld too. Oh boy. Uh, so uh, TV Cakes writes, "Hey dudes." 
I hope you and yours and all the listeners are keeping well. This is a track I used to always have on while studying and still use as a sleep aid sometimes to this day. It's got a lullaby-like feel to it and a lot of nostalgia attached to it for me, this game being my first RPG. It's apt that it plays at the school at the beginning of the game, and remember, Final Fantasy VIII is the best Final Fantasy. Good times ahead for gamers with all the announcements at the moment. So I just realized something. He's right, though. If, there if are I'm, good times ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's just something that's coming to mind. Like I noticed in the chat, that um, I guess we said Wicked Sephiroth and Bedroth goes Wicked Sephiroth. Yeah, I really missed that guy. Can you back up a little bit? Oh. Yeah. Back up. Um, Wicked Sephiroth. He goes Wicked Sephiroth. I missed that guy. He always brought the heat to the VGM's Duke Boss request line. Well, fun fact: Wicked Sephiroth responded to the very next comment below you. So, say hi to him. <laughs> He's in the chat with you right now. He's passing by. <laughs> Wave hello, hello. <laughs> but yes, Wicked Sephiroth does bring the heat. Oh yeah! I don't think I've ever heard him suggest a track that was even remotely bad. It was like, "Whoa, gotta get this bad boy rolling mm. right now." You know who else? Who else also used to bring the heat to the Haju, the haunted jukebox was Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> yes, he did. He still does. Uh, oh, uh, on the VGM jukebox, but he still brings the heat in pretty much every other facet of VGM podcasting because he's he's a prime member in all the communities. I just wish he was more available. Yeah, me too. Um. We should have an Electric Boogaloo episode. Put it on the list, actually. <sighs> okay, on the list. The list is very long now. <laughs> well, that's good. We want a long list. That means we have a lot of topics to use. This is the Electric Boogaloo Appreciation Day. We're, we're going to make it a holiday. There we go. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, I, I do love this track. That when, you, when, it first starts, when it first starts playing, it's all, it is kind of lullaby-ish. It's very sleepy time but then some of the more other instruments come in and, and, and it's like oh right i'm playing a final fantasy game <laughs> this is a town theme isn't it it is it really is actually wait well yeah balam garden it's like again it's the um well the town is balam and then the school no, 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 the military no, no, school is called the balam garden right wait it's been a while but I know I don't recall there being a Balam town it was just you're at Balam garden I mean I could be wrong again this this is a game that I'm fighting I'm blocked this game out and I'm fighting that <laughs> to get back into the mode by was it pretty sure bad? it was just Balam garden was it that I, bad come on I have to stick with the theme here though <laughs> like I'm pretty sure I'll play the game again discover that I love the game and then still say these things about it no. and it's funny because apparently if I'm looking at the the, the Skype thing properly it's the Final Fantasy VIII logo <laughs> for the use for the logo for the for the for the Skype stream too. So oh, is it? Oh, double yeah. Hilarious. yeah. I forgot. I changed. I changed the. Um, I changed the our image for for the Skype user to be different different ones, and it's actually it's. I think it was. I think your face is. I'm Cipher. Cipher. Yeah. That's and I recently met I a person who named his son Cipher. <laughs> and then we kind of bonded in a sense because I know a number of people are like, well, that's so ridiculous. Like, I'm like, I yeah, it might game. be. And he says, I hate my son. And then it's like, <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> but like, then I told him, like, I wanted to name my kid. I was like, if I ever had a daughter, her name would be Tara Celeste. Hmm. Like, that's the name. Like, I've wanted that since I was a teenager, and it's stuck for all these years. I know. It sounds like such a hippie name, though, you know? I know, but I was a hippie teenager. <laughs> like, I was always all about, save the earth. <laughs> save the earth. <laughs> so... It fit my it fit who I was as a person too. Ah, you're still kind of that way. Come on. Oh, well, it's true. Mm. It is true. All right. Well, I'm going to turn this track down, and we're going to get into the part of our show called the bonus round. But the bonus round is the bonus round. Come check out the bonus round. Mm. Uh, the bonus round is where we play covers and remixes and arrangements on our theme. Um, and this week is all Patreon listener suggestions. So my pick... No, no, yours, you're, you're first. Come on, Pernell. I go first. You're going first. And I, so probably I, the, I probably don't even have the track, so what is it? <laughs> so I could not do this episode and not pick this track that was suggested by Stephen Miller because, quite frankly, I have literally used this track to study. Like, it's, it was kismet when it showed up on the list. Like, wait, I did study with this track. It's perfect. So... Here we go. This track comes from the game Iconoclast. It is titled Indoctrination, 
And I seriously cannot remember who composed it, but I will when we come back. <laughs> Suggested by Stephen Miller. Welcome back. You're listening to Indoctrination from the game Iconoclast, composed by Joaquin Sandberg, submitted by listener Stephen Miller. And again, I could not go through the episode and not choose this track. I would have been remiss and depressed. I would have been eating ice cream for days if I did not do this, because I, this track resonates with me in such a way this was a track where when I was playing the game proper, I would let the game run just so I could hear it longer. Um, and I also have done study work to this track because it really relaxes me and it makes me, it helps me focus. It's a, the track plays at a point in the game where you're like kind of stuck in like, well, based on the title Indoctrination, you're stuck in a tower that's how that is, that has residents this takes up residence of people who are pretty much in like a sort of cult, like a let's just call it a cult. I'm not going into story specifics. Yeah, it's pretty and much. this is pretty much where they indoctrinate them into said cult. And you go through the tower, room to room, and you start to see bits and pieces of how that indoctrination takes place. And the whole time you're like fighting off security and seeing this stuff happen. And it is a genuine trip for the game proper mm-hmm. because they, like, like Rob mentioned. Like, he didn't like it for this reason. It, for me, it kind of worked, but it was very heavy-handed. It was like, oh, yeah. we're not mincing words. This is how this crap went down. Woof. There's no room for misinterpretation either. It's just, this is what it is. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind that, that, that level of storytelling sometimes, but I felt like with this game, it was just... It wasn't super necessary. Yeah. Like, he was trying to tell a story that may have been a little bit much for the gameplay. Yeah. I think but so. Like, but still, again... Um, boss fights awesome the uh, graphics and gameplay fantastic and the music is very very good oh yes yeah. like what <sighs> yeah I, w- I don't know if I could play it again per se but I think it's funny how this was one of the first times I ever like put recorded myself fighting a boss and then putting it on, on Facebook for people to see me do it mm. which was the very final bonus boss in the game which were fighting two the two cultist bodyguards simultaneously and I honestly wish the battle was harder because I wanted it to last longer because of how ridiculous it was. But every year that battle comes up in my memory feed and I always watch it. And I'm like, man, this is what I'm talking about. I need more stuff like this in my games. Um, uh, thinking about heavy handed, um, but like working for me, uh, titles. Have you ever played Popo and Yo? I have not, but I think you told me about it. It was one I want to play with the, the monster and mm-hmm. the boy. Yeah, you're you're like a little boy, and there's a giant monster that you have to keep happy, otherwise it like wreaks havoc on on everything. 
And, and there's, it's really super clear that the metaphor is that the monster is your father and the, the fruit that drives him crazy is alcohol and he's abusive and hurting you and hurting your friends and, and terrorizing the town. Um, and it's really hard. Like it's, I mean, hard to like, to, to stomach a lot of it. But then at the very end of the game, um, it actually shows you like statues of the monster and you're able to, and with through a puzzle, turn the statues, and it becomes an actual person. And you and you actually see these scenes of uh, of of the domestic abuse in real life. Jeez! Like, in, oh, in, hold that thought. Want to say, good, have a good night, Bedroth, oh, good or night. good day. Um, and in doing that, it almost made you confront what the reality is. So, mm-hmm. like before, it was like it was kind of packaging it, like in the context of the game. So you felt you were a little shielded from the reality of, of what was happening. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the game, it's like, no, this is what it is, you know. And I think normally it would have felt like, oh, they didn't have to do all of that just to show me. I already understood. But in doing that, it was like the final like punch in the gut. It was it was really really good. Um, it yeah, hard to play, <laughs> but right. really amazing game. Now you got me thinking about what you consider to be kind of like a video game equivalent to something like Pan's Labyrinth. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, along those lines, because and also the gameplay was along the lines of um, Ico, you know, kind of puzzle platforming. Um, still not not super challenging, but like really really fun in that way. Mm-hmm. And, until you start piecing together all the metaphors, and it's really tough. It's really really tough. Oof. Um, all right. So my track is coming from one of Purnell's favorites. Ooh. Yeah, man, this is coming from uh, Ease 1 and 2 Chronicles. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. So this, is, uh, <laughs> yeah. this is the TurboGrafx CD or the PC Engine CD. This is the arranged version of Fina, which I believe is the title track of the game. Composed by Yusa Koshiro and arranged by the Falcom Sound Team, Hirofumi Matsuda, Atsushi Shirakawa, Hayato, Sonatum, uh, Hayato Sonata, Hirokazu Matsumura, Wataru Ishibashi and Maiko Hattori or any combination of those um, musicians. <laughs> I just love how you read that name and my first thought it kind of went to like we need a battle for the the most hip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some of them it's it's uh yeah, Hirokazu Matsumura or Hirokazu Tanaka. <laughs> hip battle. Hip battle. All right, so let's go. This is Fina from Ease 1 and 2 Chronicles, the arranged version for the TurboGrafx CD. back you're listening to fina from ease one and two chronicles this is the theme from ease one for the turbo graphics cd composed by yuzo koshiro and arranged by the falcom sound team jdk and this was suggested by christopher Shenstrom. and he says um, i'm usually very bad at listening to music while studying 
But when I do, I listen to a lot of different songs. But one I really like is the calm, nice title song from Ease One, Fina. Have an awesome stream. Best regards, Christopher Sendstrom. I do want to address this one point that came up in the chat because listener Buttspo said he's actually never played any of the Ease games. Uh, neither have I. Oh, I played that, the Ease 3 Wanderers from Ease on the, the Sega Genesis for a little while. Yeah, I, I feel, but I was I younger feel weird about that one. I didn't know what I was doing. And it was like a side-scrolling thing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a very, it was a out it was an outlier of the rest of the franchise. Like, there's no other ease game that plays like that one does. Um, now when it comes to like recommendations for ease games, it's a it's an interesting element because like Davy Cake says, he says you know E seven and eight are relatively recent and definitely good. Um, they're all pretty much self contained, so jump in whenever. That was Davy Cake's words, and I agree with those words. However, one thing that I always tend to feel like I want to say to people when they talk about starting ease is that I always recommend starting with 1 and 2, regardless of anything else. Specifically for two reasons. One, just flat out, it's the, it's the series origins. Like, is you want to see where it started. But two, um, well, three reasons, okay. Two, to me, it still has the best narrative of any of the Ease games. Gameplay aside, it has the best narrative of any of the other games in the series. Um, and then lastly, of course, is the fact that the franchise is called Ease, but Ease 1 and 2, possibly 4, but only the Turbo CD version of 4, actually reference Ease, like why it's called Ease. So, like, it makes sense to play those even just to be like, oh, that's why they call the series Ease. Otherwise, it's just like, why is it called YS? <laughs> why is it Wise? I always thought it was Wise as a kid. Oh, I'm playing Wise. Wanderers from Wise. Until someone specifically in the game said Ease, You're like, that's what I did to it. <laughs> I needed to hear it from an actual in-game voice mm. to confirm it. But, well, yeah. yeah. For more information on the bonus round part of our show, go to rhythmandpixels.com. We have links to... Uh, remixers and, and, and arrangers, sound clouds and band camps and everywhere where you can go buy the music and support the artists. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Rhythm and Pixels. Episode 3, World 23, our second look at music for studying and selected by Patreon listeners and and, how. and, uh, st- and recorded live over a live stream for our Patreon members. Every month we do this. Yeah, It's been a good one too. Yeah, definitely. I feel like we say this every time, but that just goes to show you that every episode with Patreon members has been that good. It's like, great. It's, I feel like we find music that we, we've overlooked, you know, like, oh, that's right. I couldn't, I, that's a good idea, you know, or that's a great track. Why didn't I think of that? I think that's a large part of why I like the Patreon episodes too, is because just like we typically have a knack for like recommending tracks from games and people were like, oh, wow, I never heard of that until I heard your show. It kind of has a similar vibe here where listeners, like Patreon members, like, you should check this track. I'm like, I've never heard of that game. But you know what? I'm going to hear of it now because now I want to learn more about it thanks to your track submission. You know, so it's like, and even if that isn't the case, it's just like you said, where it's just like, I overlooked that track. And now I want to play on the show. So I just love these episodes. <laughs> yeah, they're so much fun. They're so much fun. Um, anyway, I, again, I hope everyone is safe uh, where you are. I hope you're all healthy. I hope you and your family are well. And um, thanks for taking the time to listen to us and to watch us. Um, you know, just do our little do our little show. It's just a little thing that we like to do, a little thing we like to call podcasting. I think it's kind of funny too because <laughs> I notice a lot of people will like kind of like jokingly say that the statements of "I hope you're all doing well and healthy in these troubling times" is like has become tropish at its best. Like everyone says it now. If it's in a comer- such a trope. If it's in a commercial but- and it's just like some business just trying to like be with the times, yeah, that's annoying to hear. But if it's coming from you, Pernell, I oh, know, stop. I feel it. <laughs> and also, buy Pernell brand coffee. It's delicious and it goes down smooth. Nah, but um, nah, but yeah, it's like. It's, it may be seen as tropey, but in this particular case, at least, I think it's tropey for a good reason. Like, it's 
we, a message that we need to hear more yeah, of. Yeah, I was say, we need to hear it. Yeah, it's just that good vibe being passed from person to person. Just saying, I hope you're doing well. These these are troubling times, but as a result, I mean, it doesn't mean that they have to be... They, troubling times doesn't mean that you have to be troubled. You can weather it best with the support of those who care about you. Yeah. And that's important. And that's really important. We care about you. Better believe it. Mm. Um, next week, we have um, a special guest on the show, Michael Bridgewater all the way from Newcastle, England, is coming back onto the show, and we are doing a special look at the Commodore 64 because that that machine, he is like the, the C64 historian. He really is. He's honestly the person who taught me about... He taught me to value it. Like, I ignored the C64 forever until we started communicating with him. I was like, wait a minute, there's value here. What am I doing? So I'm really excited to have have him on the show again and to, to listen to just this Commodore 64 music all day, all night long. It's going to be beepy, bleepy, and great. He also... Um, it's going to be crunchy. He, he composes music, <laughs> modern music, on the C64 for a demo scene, a demo group, I think it's in Germany. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's... He's, so we're going to have... That may be the bonus round, yeah, honestly. Well, just we're going to have... Own uh, demo scene, James. The idea is we're going to have classic music. We're going to have music composed for modern indie titles on the C64 and then we're going to have music that is maybe just demo scene music music not composed for a game but composed on the system so um, mm-hmm. it's going to be a lot of really cool sounds a lot of really cool tunes um, so my body is ready so definitely stay tuned for that that'll be next next Wednesday uh, but until then if you want to get in contact with us if you would like to say hi or if you have a track suggestion or even a topic suggestion please send us an email Rhythm and Pixels at hotmail.com. And uh, for more information about our show and a full track listing from all of our episodes and access to all of our episodes and everything else that we're doing, go to our website. Rhythmandpixels.com. Um, if you want to check us out on uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, it's Rhythm and Pixels, all one word. Go to youtube.com slash Rhythm and Pixels. We have Rhythm and Pixels Radio, which is a 24-7 radio stream of 8-bit 16-bit classics and deep cuts and for um, our highest tier patreon members we are going to have little promos and voice spots and guest spots on the radio station on rotation um on 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 that on that on on the whole thing um but only available to the highest tiers of our patreon members so if you're interested in that and you want to help support the show Go to patreon.com slash rhythm and pixels. We'll be reaching out to um, to those to those individuals uh, very soon. Um, and so if you donate for that month, you will be on the station for that month. Um, so go check that out. Um, and we like to thank our Patreon members at the end of every episode. So we like to thank um, at the FM Synthesis YM2612 level. We have Sonic Medley, Taco, Harold Howard, Dave Taylor, Reinhardt, Reinhardt Zelkova, Andreas Mailberg, Dan Lauten, Phantom Jest, Steve Miller, Autistic Gamer 89, Cameron Worma, Christopher Schenstrom, Bobby Arson from One Up Funk, Wicked Sephiroth, Carlos from the Heroes 3 podcast, Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Version, uh, for the Forever Sound Version of PGM podcast, <laughs> and Brian Pitt. And then at the C64 6581 SID chip level, we have Mike Myers. And then at Ultimate Red Book Audio level, we have That Nick Walker and The Last Recon. So thank you to all of you and, and more for your continued support of our show and everything that we're doing. It, it's, it's fantastic seeing your names. It's, it's very um, much appreciated. And as it goes, it goes without saying, but as supporters of the show, if you ever have any like thoughts and suggestions that you like to see, Almost like that Simpsons episode where they went to like the, the thought panel and they were like, Hey guys, what do you think you do to make the show better? Whatever. You're always welcome to write in and talk about that kind of stuff, too. I mean, it's, it's not guarantees, per se, obviously, but hearing feedback helps us make the show better for listeners, too. Yeah, it's it, it's really appreciated, too, because so we know what, what to do differently or what we can try um, in the future. If you have any ideas for, um, for like, little, like, add-ons and extra stuff that we could do for the Patreon to give away, um, we're, we're all ears about that, too. Hey, we should or, heck, even that, what we're doing right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let us know how good we're doing. Um, also, um, it should be, we should say that for every, every member of our Patreon, um, uh, group, uh, at any level, you get access to prequel episodes every week, which are just little talks between me and Pernell and me and Pernell and a guest for about 10, 15 minutes. 
and we also get access to a live streamed recorded episode once a month. And that's that. And I usually forget to take away access to whatever it is. So if you give for a month, have it for life. <laughs> <laughs> just, just accepts it. And uh, yeah, I'll just, I'm just announcing it. Just so you know, just so you know about it. You know, we appreciate it. So um, that's it. Yeah, next week I'm really looking forward to the show. We'll be recording <laughs> that next weekend. Still waiting on those copies of Lobster Racing, as Davy King says. Oh, I gotta <laughs> make that. I forgot. I've been working Lobster on. Um, I've been working on a bullet health title. Um, I'm almost done. I'm almost done a lot of it, but uh, once that's finished, I might do a. I might make a lobster racing game. You have to. You can't. You have to. I, I can't I'm just thinking about the dip- but lobster racing. What would the different characters even be? It'd be yeah, like blue lobster, names. red lobster. No, 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 no. They have, they have to have names. They could be like George, George the no, lobster. No, but the red lobster would have to be named Red Lobster. It's just red lobster. He's for the seafood lover in you. You have to choose that one if you love seafood. <laughs> it's just a Flappy Birds clone. Is what it is. <laughs> anyway, sold. Hmm? Now I was saying sold. Oh, sold. Okay. I thought you said oh. Anyway, thanks everybody for listening. Thanks for uh, for for sticking out with us for the whole episode. Uh, we'll see you next week. My name is Rob Nichols, and I'm Pernell. I have a good week. And remember, it's kind of something that we've been saying across the entire episode, so this isn't anything new. But nonetheless, you know, do what you can for your communities in this situation of ours because the community needs your support now more than ever. And for what it's worth, this may be a little bit too much, but I still think it's worth saying for the episode proper. Remember, though we are dealing with a situation that involves riots, protests, and the like... It is worth remembering that people feel how they feel about a number of these rents, and most of it is pretty much understandable. There's very few things I've heard from people that are not understandable feelings to have. But what's most important throughout all of it is that we remember that it all started because of specific events. If we want we want to do what we can in our society as a whole to better it and make it so that we don't feel the need to have such incidents occur going forward just do what we can as best we can for our society be good people be awesome people and quite frankly we'll have a better we can we can work together to make a better world as a result of those actions it's just worth trying <laughs>